Hey everyone, welcome back. Now this is episode 2 of Xeon 6. Now this is the name that I'm giving this budget build. As a kid, I grew up in the 80s and I was a huge fan of a cartoon called Bionic 6. It had such a great catchy theme to it, like many cartoons of the 80s, not to mention some regular sitcoms and television shows that had some pretty good intros. The intro to Bionic 6 was an anime intro that kind of felt like it was ahead of its time. If you have a chance to, go ahead and check it out online. Though it's going to be kind of difficult to find a really good copy of it on YouTube since it'll get claimed right away and YouTube won't even let you post it. But the name of this build is Xeon 6. It provides the 6 cores and 12 threads from the Intel Xeon E51650 processor. A processor which can be found for about $40 in most places like eBay and AliExpress. This processor is also unlocked so we're able to overclock it. The motherboard that we're using is the Kita X79 Micro ATX motherboard. It's a $55 board which does provide us the basics that we do need to build ourselves a decent gaming system. Its default BIOS does allow us to overclock the processor to 3.9 GHz and we're able to set our memory to 1866. On top of that we get quad channel memory, we're able to use registered ECC memory and we have a, we have a slot for an NVMe drive. I would recommend checking out the prior video for more information about the board itself along with the core components that we're putting into this build. For this episode we're going to be taking a look at gaming. I'll try to post a third episode which will go into other general benchmarks and other technical stuff. So let's roll the montage for the games that we've tested and afterwards we're going to go into the numbers. Here we go, quite a handful of games, but it was definitely worth it. We're running at 1080p with VSync disabled, drivers are up to date as of the time of running these benchmarks. Assassin's Creed Odyssey gives us close to 60 frames per second on average, where Origins gives us about 46 frames per second. For both games, we're using a very high preset and I imagine that if we were to lower that just a bit, we might maybe hit 60 frames per second. But a third person single player game, I'm pretty satisfied with the numbers that we're getting with this budget system. Far Cry 5 runs great on the Ultra preset where it gives us 76 frames per second and Ghost Recon Wildlands is right behind at 72 frames per second with the very high preset for the graphics. Rainbow Six Siege is off the charts at about 177 frames per second on the Ultra preset. We get 58 frames per second on average with the Division 2 which is perfect since it's somewhat of a demanding game, at least in my opinion. Watch Dogs 2 trails right behind with 53 frames per second on average. Arkham Knight with its Unreal Engine provides us a unique style and we get 113 frames per second on the high preset and of course this is with the Nvidia Gameworks features disabled. CSGO is at 172 frames per second, kind of odd since Rainbow Six Siege is a newer and better looking game and that one runs at 177 frames per second. Mankind Divided with DX11 provides a 74 frames per second, Devil May Cry is at 124 frames per second and Hitman from 2016 is at 73 frames per second on average. 
A couple of other games that were in the 70s are Just Cause 4 and Mafia 3. Shadow of Mortar is an older title, but there's no harm in seeing how older titles do with this type of setup. It averages 127 frames per second on average. The strong and adventurous Lara Croft does quite well on this older CPU with Rise of the Tomb Raider running at 95 frames per second on average, and Shadow of the Tomb Raider with DX12 gives us 82 frames per second. PUBG is at 103 frames per second on average, and Apex Legends is at 96 frames per second, two battle royale type games which run well on this system. The Witcher 3 on Ultra does quite well at 66 frames per second. A new title recently released on PC is Death Stranding. I'm looking forward to finishing this one and I'm pretty happy to say that we do get about 74 frames per second on average for a very beautiful looking game. Alright, so all of these games were on the E5 1650 overclocked to 3.9 GHz and the dual channel memory at 1866. Let's go ahead and test out quad channel memory to see if it makes a difference. I put in 4 sticks of 4GB each of DDR3 memory which was advertised at 1600MHz but through the BIOS we were able to bump it up to 1866. One thing to note is that the dual channel memory we used is registered ECC memory. The 4 sticks of 4GB each is standard desktop RAM. The timings on the desktop memory are a little bit better with case latency of 12 whereas the server memory was at 13. Not a huge difference, but I might go back into this system and test it to where I'm going to be using just strictly server memory with dual and quad channels to see if there's a really, you know, if there's a huge, huge difference. The reason I used desktop memory was that this is what I had available within Armour's Reach when testing out the system. So here we have the same games, same settings, but running with quad channel memory. There is a difference, and the difference is good. In a handful of games, you do get a bump of 5 or more frames per second on average. A couple of games do see a huge jump like Rainbow Six Siege and CSGO. Devil May Cry 5 and Hitman also take advantage of the quad channel memory, as well as Rise of the Tomb Raider, Apex Legends, and The Witcher 3. In the first episode, I mentioned that I would explain why I chose the GTX 980 Ti for this system. Well, now we're going to compare these numbers to the gaming HTPC that I put together earlier this year. That system is using a Ryzen 1600 AF overclock to 4 GHz, all cores, as it has 16 GB of DDR4 memory at 2933, and we've also tested that system with the GTX 980 Ti, the same exact card that we have here in this system, and also it's overclocked to the same speed. And here are the numbers comparing it to the Ryzen system, same games, same graphics settings. They are quite close to each other. In most games, the Ryzen 1600 AF does come ahead, but not by a lot. In other games, it's way ahead. But there are a couple of games where the E5 1650 does surpass the Ryzen 1600 AF. For the motherboard, RAM and processor, I spent about $240 for the Ryzen system. Now this was back in the beginning of the year before the prices went up due to the whole global thing that's going on right now. And even now you can't even really find the 1600 AF for $85 anymore, at least on here in the US. The motherboard, RAM and processor for the E5 1650 system came to just shy of $130. That's almost half of what it costs to put together the Ryzen 1600 AF system and is able to keep up trading blows with the AMD chip. The E5 1650 with this very inexpensive motherboard is a great solution for those who are on a really tight budget and want to put together a decent gaming system. The 16GB of memory will handle games just fine. There are a couple of downsides though. For example, warranty is very very limited. The processor is used. Some eBay or AliExpress sellers may offer a 30 day warranty, 60 days or maybe 90 days. I think I saw one seller on AliExpress who was offering a full 1 year warranty but I can't, remember, I can't remember if it was for the 1650 or if it was a different processor. This was when I was browsing around the other day and I just couldn't remember what processor it was for. This motherboard's warranty may also be limited compared to buying a brand new motherboard on a current platform and the same thing goes for the RAM. The other downside is that this is an older platform. Its days may be coming to an end in the near future. When will that be? It's kind of hard to say but I think it might have a good couple of more years left. Another thing would be that this motherboard doesn't have any fancy RGB LED headers, but there are alternatives for people who do want to add that RGB goodness to a build. That's about it for this episode. Even though it was time consuming benchmarking all these games twice for dual channel and quad channel memory, I did have a lot of fun. And then comparing these numbers to the HTPC, I was just blown away. I was like, WTF, that's a nice surprise. For a second, I almost regretted buying the 1600 AF since I could have saved myself some money. Well, I'll probably put out one more episode of Xeon 6, which will show some other benchmarks, as well as putting everything inside of a case, kind of like make it look nice. In the meantime, I do want to thank you for watching. Take care and have a great day.